And uh, hi, everybody. And uh, everybody at home, too. Thank you so much for coming. This is our uh, first of, um, hopefully, every month we'll have a, an event like this. So thank you very much, Kate. And maybe I'll just read your bio so everybody can uh, appreciate um, that you're here. So Kate Denial is the Bright Distinguished Professor of American History and Director of the Bright Institute at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. Her new book, Pedagogy of Kindness, is now available for the University of Oklahoma Press. Her historical research has examined the early 19th century experience of pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing in upper Midwestern Ojibwe and missionary cultures. Research that grew from Kate's previous book, Making Marriages, Husbands, Wives, in the American State in Dakota and Ojibwe County. Country. From July 2022 to December 2023, Kate was a PI on a very large Mellon-funded grant bringing together 36 participants from across higher education in the United States to explore pedagogies, communities, and practices of care in the academy after COVID. Kate consults on teaching in higher education, which is how I first uh, met you, because you gave uh, a really wonderful talk through CPI. Uh, but she consults with individuals, departments, and institutions in the U.S., U.K., Ireland, Canada, and Australia. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your talk, Pedagogy of Kindness, and the uh, discussion that I hope will follow. Thank you very much. I'll leave it to you now. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, let me just start my timer, and then we'll get going. And please just yell if anything goes wrong with the sound or the, the visuals, okay? So it's so good to be with you here this morning. Um, you can access these slides at this shortened URL or at this QR code. The noise in the room is still pretty loud. Um, just in case. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so you can access these slides at this URL or at this QR code. Uh, it will take you to a view-only version of the slides, but you can make a copy. And then you can keep notes on that copy. You can see the embedded alt text in the images, anything else that you need. So I'll just wait a second for people to have a chance to do that. I'm just wondering if it's actually maybe possible for the room to be muted while Kate's speaking. It's just really difficult to hear over the room noise? Um, it's possible, I wouldn't recommend it, but I'll just turn this down. How's that sounding over there? Has that changed anything for you? It's, it's less buzzy, I think. Okay. Let's Is give that... it a try. Okay. This is the slide that just tells you this is my work, so um, please don't steal it. <laughs> and for those who have vision or reading difficulties, I'm going to read the text on each slide aloud. I always start my presentations by talking about the people who've taught me, so I want to express my gratitude to everyone who was at the Digital Pedagogy Lab in 2017 to Charles Bailing and Roger Fisher from the Program on Intergroup Relations in Michigan, Karen Costa, Claire Mahoney, Judith Duttle, Melissa Whaler, and Jessamine Newhouse, who are part of my online group of uh, pedagogy colleagues, and my colleagues who are at Knox College, Gabriel Rayleigh Carlin, Jennifer Fruber, Deirdre Doherty, Hilary Lehman, and Mary Arman, and of course, my students who teach me the most out of anyone. This is our agenda for this morning. So I'm going to introduce myself. We're going to talk about education and kindness in broad terms. We're going to talk about where do we begin with a pedagogy of kindness. And we're going to take some Q&A after we've talked about what pedagogy of kindness is. So let me introduce myself in a slightly different way to the way that Erin introduced me. This is me. I have a preference for bright colors. <laughs> I am originally from Sheffield in the north of England. And if you can't hear an accent, that's because I moved to the States 30 years ago. And also when I went to college, an hour south of where I grew up, nobody understood me. And so I had to learn to put aside my dialect and mimic whatever I heard, which is a real problem if you get me in a room full of people from Ireland. 
I am a first generation student and this is my alma mater, the University of Nottingham in England. I emigrated to the US in 1994 to go to grad school at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I got my PhD in US history from the University of Iowa in 2005. And since then, I have been working as a professor of American history at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. I wish I could tell you it was as perfect to work there as this, perf this picture makes it look. My specialties are the histories of women, gender, and sexuality, and indigenous people. I was a faculty ombudsperson for six years. I am a giant Captain America fan, so much so that I had my public history students make an exhibition about Captain America in American history so that we could have the most fun possible in one particular class. I love to bake. I hate to cook. I just finished reading the graphic novel Nat Turner by Kyle Baker, which I recommend. My favorite wind down show of late is Interview with the Vampire. And I love to paint watercolors, play the banjo very, very badly, and to knit. And I am super pleased to meet you all. So let's talk about education and kindness. Most people are not setting out to be unkind to one another or to their students. The problem is that there is a certain culture in higher ed in which we are all swimming. A pedagogy of kindness helps to keep us oriented towards compassion despite the pressures that are around us. It provides structure to make our innate kindness visible and practical, and that humanizes everyone who's involved in education. So is higher ed kind? In general, no, it's not. We are socialized from a very early point in time into distrust. There are powerful cultural stories all around us about what success means in post-secondary education. They include things like the apex of all work in higher ed is about a solitary genius, that person who is in their ivory tower or in their lab, needs no one else, who is supported by no one else, and yet manages to produce incredible work. The valorization of research above all the other things that people do in a university setting is also part of that socialization and mythology. There's also competition. We are socialized into competition from the moment we start to think about which colleges or universities we want to go to, which graduate programs we want to enter, where we would like to get a job, can we get a job, what kind of job do we want? All of these things, including grants and fellowships, also add up to that competitive sort of atmosphere. And then there's the hierarchies that are embedded within our institutions, all of which also add to that distrust. Who can you speak to freely? Who might take some sort of retribution on you for something you said casually at some other time? Those things haunt the halls of academia. And then there's things like the word smart and intelligent, which are deeply rooted in the eugenics movement and yet have come to be a shorthand for who belongs. And then there's exclusion and the people who have not been part of uh, higher ed and who are still trying to become part of higher ed and whether or not we actually let them into the room. So let me give myself as an example. As a graduate student, and that's me as a graduate student in 1994, I was taught that students are our antagonists. They plagiarize, they cheat, they won't do the reading, they will challenge their grades on a whim, and I should suspect students of nefarious purposes at all times. What we all learn to do better, experience teaches us differently, as do our students, hopefully, our colleagues do too, and if we're lucky, the kind of professional development that we get helps us. For me, there were four particular things that led to me zoning in on kindness as the sort of operative framework for my teaching. 
The first was a project called Bringing History Home, where for 10 years, I was the lead historian of a program in Iowa that taught K-12 teachers how to teach their students to work like a historian. So instead of just reading books or hearing lectures, those students right as young as kindergarten were actually doing history, taking artifacts and pieces of information from the past and weaving them into argument and narrative. There are few things that will make you understand what kindness is than working with teachers who are working with very young children. And so I learned a tremendous amount from the master teachers in our program. The second thing was learning about intergroup dialogue. And this was a program I was trained in about 10 years ago now. Intergroup dialogue is a way of communicating across vast social differences and talking about really thorny, contentious problems around race, gender, sexuality, disability, religion, and so on. Once you've been taught how to have these particular kind of structured dialogues, it's the kind of thing that slops out of its bucket and into everything else. So once I started this program, I started to employ it in all of my classes. And then there's the fact that I live with PTSD. And part of my recovery has been learning to be extremely kind to myself in instances when I don't want to be kind and where I often want to take the blame for things that other people have done. The last thing was going to the Digital Pedagogy Lab in 2017 in Virginia. There I was asked to critically question everything about my teaching. I thought I was going to learn some new digital tools, and I certainly did that, but not until I'd been asked these very pertinent questions. DPL was the first time I'd been asked so bluntly to defend my pedagogical choices. And once I reflected, I found much of my pedagogy indefensible. At the time, I felt regret and no small amount of embarrassment. My teaching was undone by the presence of a question that was never articulated quite this directly, but was everywhere around me. Why not be kind? So where do we begin with this project of kindness? The first thing is we need to define our terms. What does kindness mean to me? Well, it's easiest to start with what it is not. Kindness is not being nice. Nicenessness puts band-aids over deep wounds in our institution, and it lies. It lies about things like precarity and how much of our profession has been uh, consumed by precarity over the last several years. It lies about power imbalances between us and our colleagues, between faculty and staff, between administrators and the rest of the college and university. It lies about concepts like tradition and rigor, which are generally accepted as things that we want to see in our classrooms, and yet sometimes those are used as dog whistles for something else entirely. It lies about burnout and exhaustion and how very, very real those things are, especially as we continue to move through a pandemic. Kindness, on the other hand, is honest. And I wanna give you three examples of things that I think it's really honest about. The first is positionality. Academia continues to be hostile to so many of us along axes of race, gender, sexuality, religion, nationality, citizenship, disability, and class. Where do we have power and where do we suffer from its lack? It's also honest about accountability. To dismiss the places where we trip in word, thought, or action without reflecting on the impact of each is nothing more than being nice. Relieving ourselves of responsibility and prioritizing feeling good over being just. And it's honest about being a discipline. We will not always feel like being compassionate, but we don't need to direct our energy into niceness. Instead, we need to remind ourselves that we believe in compassion and act upon that belief even on the days when we are spitting mad, hollowed out, and heart sore. So where do we begin? with ourselves. So kindness towards the self includes many things. 
and includes incremental change. So while it is often tempting to want to burn absolutely everything down and start over, that is a massive undertaking. And so learning to be able to make one change at a time, see the results and continue to adjust is really vital. It's about recognizing that you know your job and what is necessary and workable about it. You are the authority in your classroom. It's also about knowing the boundaries that you need and that will work for you. And it's about giving yourself time and space, especially for reflection. As I've traveled around um, the United States and Canada thinking about kindness, I have distilled down six pieces of advice that faculty have offered about places to begin with this kindness journey towards ourselves. The first is to set email hours and to communicate them really clearly. Our students are free to contact us at any time they want, but that does not mean that we should be available 24 seven to reply. So I have email hours that go from nine till six, for example. I have email hours that do not extend into my weekend. You have to set the email hours that work for you. I take an entire day away from email every week. And for some people that's flat out terrifying, but I would suggest that taking a solid block of time away from email is super important if we're to clear our minds and refill our cups. So maybe it's that you take a whole morning, or maybe it's that you take the notifications off your email on your phone. So even if email is coming in, it has to be your choice to go look at it, not your phone's choice to tell you that it's coming in. Time for lunch or dinner, depending on your schedule, is really important. I discovered this when I got diagnosed with diabetes a couple of years ago, and I realized I couldn't live on mini Snickers bars and string cheese anymore during the day. So I put lunch on my calendar and made it a non-negotiable appointment with myself every single day. I would not allow meetings to be scheduled in that time. This is a basic need to fuel ourselves. And yet so often we try to do 17 different things while also putting those mini Snickers bars in our mouths. Commuting to work is work and we should count it as such. We have a limited amount of energy every day. And if we use an hour of that energy trying to get to work on the train, the bus, in traffic, then some of that finite energy is gone. And we should not then demand of ourselves that we put in a whole eight hours once we get to work um, without taking into account that we spent that energy getting there. Building in flex days is super important. So the end of my syllabi, I always have a couple of days that are just marked as flexible days, but you can call them whatever you want. Those days are there to move into my schedule when I need them. It might be that my students are having difficulty with a concept and we need two class periods to go at it. It might be that I'm sick. It might be that most of my class is sick. It might be that we all just need a mental health day. Whatever the cause is, having that day to move into your schedule saves you from trying to cram everything in your schedule in without a break. And the last thing is community. Your community may not be in your department or your division. It may not be on your campus, but all of us really need to find community that sustains us. Isolation can be crushing. And so thinking of ways to reach out to other like-minded people, whether that's online or off, is a great way to feel that you have that support network you need in place to be a whole human being. So let's move into a pedagogy of kindness and actually what makes up that way of teaching. It's made up of three things. The first is justice. The second is believing students. And the third is believing in students. So let's take justice first. Your student body is tremendously diverse along multiple lines, race, gender, sexuality, religion, class, age, and disability, and more. It's part-time and full-time students. 
It's the kinship responsibilities and care work that they're involved in. It's the jobs that they have as well. So what does that have to do with kindness? There is a sea change happening in how people engage with education, and it can get really exhausting. We need to understand the many directions in which we and our students are pulled. We need to rethink engagement. This is a colleague of mine, Karen Costa, who wrote a wonderful piece about engagement and students. And one of the things that she said is that when she asked faculty who I work with, what they most want for their teaching, hands down the most common answer is student engagement. She goes on to say, it's not that students are disengaged, but that they're engaged with and by other things. She says that part of the problem is that we often want students to replicate our own patterns of engagement. We want them to be students in the ways that we were once students. But as Costa says, our students are deeply engaged in learning, in activism, in dreaming and enacting a better world for all life on this planet. But she says, there are desire paths that they're showing us. So this is a photograph of a desire path. You can see on the left that there is a paved path and along the top of the screen, there's another paved path. So people could get over to that building on the right using those paths. It's much more direct, however, for people to just wander across the lawn and you can see the path that has been forged by countless people walking in that direction. That path is a desire path, showing us where people want to go. Costa asks, are we willing to pave the desire path with our students? Are we willing to broaden our understanding of student engagement? This is not about bad people, she cautions. It's about bad systems. So we must take into account our students' kinship responsibilities, work commitments, financial obligations, disabilities, and reaction to global politics and climate change and meet them in that space. We cannot assume that the things that seem apparent to us about education are also apparent to them. The pandemic has done more than make us ill, grief-stricken, and overloaded. It has prompted people to reconsider their relationship to work, to office spaces, to education, and to life goals. Now more than ever, we cannot rely on our own belief that our disciplines are full of useful and worthy information and automatically expect students to agree and find meaning in our assignments. We must take a hard look at what we're asking students to do and then identify if there is value in it. If there is, we need to be able to explain that value to students as clearly and directly as we can. So this is justice and kindness. It's about questioning our assumptions. Do we know who our students are? And crucially, do we know who they are not? It's about extending the benefit of the doubt to students, even when we encounter something that we think might be outlandish. And it's about suspending disbelief. It's about believing in what and how much students are telling us about their educational experience, because they are the experts on it. So the second step is believing students. You will have heard some of the things I'm about to put on the screen before. My printer broke. I was sick. Someone died. My laptop crashed. These are really common things that people say when they're unable to get a certain piece of work done for us in our courses. And I would suggest that in every instance, our job is to believe them. This is about cultivating trust, not only with the student who is in front of us, but with all the students who are in that class and who are going to hear about this from that student in question. Now, I always get a question about this. Uh, aren't there students who are going to try and pull one over on me? And undoubtedly there are. But I might disbelieve a student who is in genuine crisis. 
And I would rather deal with outlying situations as and when they arise, rather than suspect everyone of being trying to get up to something. Even if a student is lying about their particular thing, their laptop crashing, whatever it is, there is an underlying problem to address about why they couldn't turn in their work on time, and that's worth finding out about. And so the last part is about believing in students. It's about believing in students' creativity, thoughtfulness, and capacity to learn, and collaborating with students on their learning. So I'm going to use my syllabus as an example of what this means in real practical terms. This is what my syllabus looked like in 2017 before I went to the Digital Pedagogy Lab. And at DPL, I was asked, who is the student you're imagining as you write your syllabus? What do you communicate about who you are in the way that you talk about your policies? And is your syllabus accessible to as many students as possible? I had to admit that once I reflected, I realized the student I was imagining as I wrote was someone I did not trust. My syllabus was a highly sort of faux legalistic document outlining all the ways in which I thought someone might screw up and the penalties when they did. What did I communicate about who I was in my policies? That I was in a position of unassailable authority and I was not approachable. And was my syllabus accessible? Absolutely not. It was a wall of text. So here's that first page of the syllabus without the image attached. You can see that I just list a bunch of information as the first thing students would read. I don't offer any context. I don't offer a welcome. I just say, hey, Kate Denial, here's my office. Here's my phone number. Here's my office hours. I don't explain what office hours are for, and neither do I explain what the cryptic 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. except 5 p.m. Friday to 5 p.m. Saturday actually meant in relation to email. I then have one of the more boring descriptions of an American history course ever put on paper, and then I go straight to a required text, again, without contextual information. Then as you got into the main body of my syllabus, you would see a page very like this. It's not necessary to have read every single word of this to understand that this is hard for students with ADHD and reading comprehension difficulties to parse. It is such a lot of small text in a big chunk. Also, I had a very harsh attendance and participation policy. It was convoluted, it was hard to understand, and it took two paragraphs for me to explain. And I also didn't believe in my students. I used distant authoritarian language, again, assuming they would screw up or that they were trying to get one over on me and that was the way I had to respond. This is a sample page from a syllabus now. I am not suggesting that your syllabus needs to look exactly like mine. I'm offering this simply as a demonstration of how I've changed the way that I think about the syllabus as a document. So now I have a cheerful header that has alt text embedded in it for people who are using screen readers. I use a much clearer font and different spacing. I offer a welcome to my students and I model my use of pronouns. I do not insist that my students tell me their pronouns, but model that I think it's important they know mine. And then the first thing that you see is that email policy, but now it is explained. And you can see that I am being both transparent and I'm putting in place really important boundaries for myself, which is kindness towards me. This is another page. I have icons that help my students navigate the text. And so I'm breaking it up into smaller chunks and offering those pictures to help them find things. I use a universal design for learning framing, and that means I'm trying to anticipate as many needs as possible as I design this document. So that means things like, for instance, not using a lot of red or green in my design because of students who may be red green colorblind. I have taken steps to maximize the means of communication offered to my students. 
a link to email addresses so they can click and write. I offer phone numbers. If there is a website, I will link to that too, rather than simply describing these things in text and leaving students to find them on their own. This was the honor code language in my syllabus from the old syllabus. The Knox College community expects its members to demonstrate a high degree of ethical integrity in all their actions, including their academic work. Examples of academic dishonesty include plagiarism, which you will note I don't define, giving or receiving unauthorized help, which always raises the question, what did authorized help look like? and voluntarily assisting another student in cheating. Could you involuntarily assist someone with cheating and get into trouble? Was another question that I often got. This is what my same section of my syllabus looks like now. We commit ourselves, not them, not me, but we as a community, commit ourselves to act with academic integrity this term, to be ethical in what we say and write and to offer credit to others for thinking of ideas before us. A much better plain language description of what we're trying to do. And this is the most important line in this statement. I believe that everyone in my course is fundamentally honest and I will help you learn the conventions of academic integrity. Now, a lot of people deal with boilerplates from their institutions, language that you must include that you don't get to write and influence the tone of at all. So there, I would take a tip from Remy Kilir and have your students annotate the text. Annotations can take place in class. They could take place as homework, but you can collect in those annotations and you can read them or you can choose just to have a discussion with your students about their thoughts. So it's a wonderful way to teach them how to take good notes directly on a document and then have them speak back to language that they didn't get a chance to really speak back to before. In large lectures, you can have students talk to a partner or to a small group of three or four and then maybe report out the top two or three things that they noticed or that they had questions about. If you are worried that by doing all of this, your syllabus is going to be too long, Andrew Delatonio at the U University of Texas Austin has a great suggestion, which is to have a one page syllabus summary with links to crucial pieces of information. He has found this has really upped to the number of people who are in interacting with his syllabus. And then there's the question of our syllabi and who has a seat at the table. When we ask students to read certain authors or watch certain media or listen to certain voices, whose points of view do we prioritize? Will our students see themselves reflected back from the curriculum and from the faculty and staff of the college or be implicitly told they come from cultures and traditions without knowledge that higher and continuing ed deem worthy of respect. There's also the question of kindness and generative AI, right? When we come to thinking about trusting our students and, and trusting that they don't all have nefarious purposes, generative AI is something that has really thrown a wrench into the works. We feel a lot of pressure to solve the challenges presented by the existence of generative AI but things done at speed can often lead to regret. There are no reliable tools that will detect the use of things like ChatGPT, but we can decide that in this pedagogy of kindness, we're going to lead with trust. Our classrooms are not full of students with nefarious purposes. Can we articulate the reasons for our pedagogical choices to our students in positive terms? And can we slow things down a little bit? So I would suggest that as we believe in our students, we can collaborate with them and extend trust to them when it comes to matters of generative AI. One way that I've done this with my students is with ungraded reading reflections after everything that they do. And most specifically in this case, after reading a selection of news sources that are about some of the ethical questions raised by generative AI. 
These reading reflections all ask the same question. What new things did you learn from today's reading? What do you think it's important that we talk about today? What left you confused? What questions do you have? And is there anything else you want to share? That last question being a catch-all for things my questions didn't catch. It's also where they tell me what music they're listening to, what their favorite movie is, or perhaps tell them me something that is impacting their abilities to participate in class, like a breakup or an illness. Here are some of the things I've had my students read, for example, around this issue of generative AI. They've read a piece from The Guardian which talks about the labor practices involved with generative AI. To teach Bard, Bing, or ChatGPT to recognize prompts that will generate harmful materials, algorithms must be fed examples of hate speech, violence, and sexual abuse. Someone then has to remove those things before it can become part of the text that ChatGPT draws upon. And those are overwhelmingly people in Africa who are underage. Even in the United States, stress, low pay, minimal instructions, inconsistent tasks, and tight deadlines, the sheer volume of data needed to train AI models almost necessitates a rush job, and they're a recipe for human error. I have them read about environmental concerns. I need, AI sorry, needs water to generate the electricity that powers servers and water to cool them. A 100 word query into ChatGPT takes about one bottle of water to cool the servers. The ethical considerations are enormous when we consider global water shortages, climate change and profit motives. There's also a very recent report about the fact that real emissions from the in-house or company owned data centers of Google, Microsoft, Meta and Apple are probably about 662% higher than officially reported. And this is a major thing that is fueling climate change. We talk about access. We talk about the fact that products like ChatGPT are rarely designed with disabled users in mind, meaning whatever benefits a large language model might offer are inequitably distributed across our campuses. And we talk about the fact that developers are moving to be first in a field, but not necessarily to think about access. We also talk about how large language models work. So ChatGPT and other similar products do not generate knowledge, but instead work by means of sophisticated predictive text operations. And I wanna show you an exercise that I do with my students in class that sort of models this for them on a smaller scale. So I ask them to write the history of yesterday using predictive text on their phone. I give them a couple of minutes and keep time. And then I ask them what they ended up writing. They share what always turn out to be nonsense stories, right? And that's because they are limited by a, a piece of technology that is trying to predict what the most likely next word is in a sentence. It's an imperfect comparison to what a large language model does, but it does give them a sense of why sometimes ChatGPT does not work the way that they think it should. And then we share those things out in the chat when I'm teaching online or in person if I'm in a classroom face to face with those students. We also talk about data mining. It is important that my students know what happens to the data they're providing to AI systems. And we also talk about how we talk about artificial intelligence. New technologies need simple metaphors to thrive. This is a line from a beautiful article about the way that we talk about AI. Myths and metaphors aren't just rhetorical flourishes, they are about power. They tell us who has it, who should have it, and how they should use it and in the service of what goal. So this is important when we think about the fact that most of the language surrounding generative AI leans towards the positive where tech is concerned and obfuscates the things that are social consequences of AI use. So the question is, does this work? These are responses from my students. They have all been anonymized and I have their permission to share their quotes. 
that this was what they said in their reading reflections. I've never heard about this before. I did not know anything about this topic. Thank you for having us learn about this. I'm really glad I know about it now. Thank you for bringing this attention to my, this issue to my attention. I didn't know anything about it. And here are some longer reflections from those same uh, reflective questions. I think it's important that we go beyond the conversations about academic integrity surrounding ChatGPT to address the effects that AI is having on folks, including children, in the global south and think about why this is not a bigger part of the conversation around the ethics of AI. Most of the time we only talk about AI in terms of academic integrity, which is important, but this information frames it in a new way. As a society, I feel like we never care about what goes on behind closed doors. Instead, we're content with the shiny new toy and want to see what it can do and leave the rest for someone else to worry about. We are asking the wrong questions. Can we do this instead of should we? I then have my students put together a position statement. I have them do the metacognitive work of articulating their position on whether they will use generative AI. Will they use it? And if so, in what ways? To achieve what ends? And if they won't use it, what has shaped that decision making? I also have worked with colleagues across different campuses to think about how to draft and redraft assignments so that they are less AI susceptible. So I have students write for homework, for example, bring that homework in and then have everyone review that with a peer in class. I offer in class time for lots of redrafting. And then we have scissors day where people bring in their whole paper cut it up into little paragraphs, shuffle that like a deck of cards and give it to someone to put back together. That person does so in the way that makes sense to them, not necessarily, in fact, rarely in the way that it was actually first written. In other kinds of disciplines, you may have your students take a quiz, but then you can have them bring it back and do class review with the time in class to rework their answers. This is building on critical thinking skills, on metacognitive reflection, and it's offering the chance for people to actually learn from mistakes. This is one way of thinking about AI that comes from Leon Furs, who is great at thinking about these ideas, and he thinks of AI use as a spectrum. So I wanted to just give you this reference. There is a link embedded in this slide to his website. And then there's a link on this slide too. He says we can go from banning AI to letting AI in, but we can also do many things in the middle. And he gives lots of structured ways of thinking about those choices. While we're rethinking our assessments, we can also really work with our students, collaborate with them and believe in them by doing different kinds of assignments. So authentic assessment is a wonderful choice. Authentic assessment has meaning beyond the classroom and an audience other than you. It is really a demonstration of believing in our students. So at Knox, we have biofuels week. The general chemistry students create a biofuel. The organic chemistry students identify its components and the physical chemistry students perform combustion tests to determine its efficiency. This is what a couple of students had to say about that experience. This lab teaches me how to work as a team member and how to communicate effectively, which is important for my career as a research scientist. We have a chance to learn not only technical skills, but also interpersonal skills. I think my experiences in all of my labs leading up to Biofuels Week helped prepare me for this. Because we were working with general organic and physical chemistry, there were concepts that I learned as a first year that came back up this week. I had my students do an authentic assessment when they built a website called beforenox.com, which is all about the history of this region of the United States before our college was built. Students did research into various topics related to that overarching subject. They put together a timeline and linked primary sources to it. 
they wrote individual blog posts that also had primary sources attached. And this is what I mean by authentic assessment. We had a message from Ana Naruto Moya, who's the project director of the Indigenous Digital Archive, about how useful she had found this particular website. And that was information that my students really cherished. So, in conclusion, I want to say to you that kindness really, really matters in the classroom, that it is about our honesty, it is about not misleading people, and it is about really thinking about ourselves and our students as whole human beings. And I want to lead you, leave you with a piece of poetry by Naomi Shihab Nye. This is part of her longer poem, Kindness. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it until your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. Thank you, everybody. I would love to hear what your questions are today. I think the main room is still muted. There we go. <laughs> you didn't hear a round of applause. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Everybody's processing this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a question at home. Kate, do you want to unmute your mic? First of all, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, um, sharing your thoughts and they align really well with a lot of the things I think about pedagogy. So first of all, thank you so much for that. Um, second, I guess I want to um, get your insight about how you navigate conversations with like colleagues or other professors who push back against um, this this approach? Like, how do you um, how do you manage those conversations? Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I'm asking. Okay, that's a great question. And usually, I ask them for a specific thing that they are worried about or concerned about, and I deal with that specific thing. So often it is that people confuse kindness and niceness, and they think that I'm just out to have a conflict-free life, right? And I will just say whatever will make that happen. And so reiterating that, no, that's not what kindness is actually about, and to reiterate that kindness will be honest in situations where niceness will lie, is really important. I also um, get a lot of questions about boundaries and about students just sort of taking too much. And that is a real concern, I think, for all of us coming out of the most acute phase of the pandemic and having given so much to change our teaching over and over over the last few years that a lot of us are burned out and exhausted. And it feels like maybe this is going to ask even more of us. So pointing out that no, if you set in place those really good boundaries around things like email and about office hours, if you are approachable, it actually makes things easier in the long run because you are not constantly policing your students. You are not always tensed for there to be some kind of altercation or um, people sort of resenting you and resisting you. Um, and you have those boundaries in place to protect your time and your wellness. So I think specificity is key. Wonderful, thanks so much. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up? Go ahead. I want, I, 
something that I've struggled with as I've tried to adopt that kind of pedagogy is um, you mentioned the word rigor and how it can be a, a tricky word in its meaning. But something I've struggled with is like how to maintain rigor in the classroom. What, do, what even rigor means, I don't know. But um, I think maintaining what maybe what I was trained to believe was rigor in okay. an environment that um, is less, I don't know, structured around power. I don't know. <laughs> right. So I think that um, standards are great, right? We all have standards. We all have things that we want our students to achieve. What rigor all, almost always masks is a lot of hoop jumping, right? Um, my colleague Kevin Gannon says, you know, like there's rigor around, um, you know, I want you to think, I want you to engage, and that's great. That's standards. But when it's rigor around things like, if your paper is one minute late, I will not accept it. If your rigor is around, if you put this in a 12 point font that I did not pre-approve, if your rigor is about, um, if you show up to class, I will have closed the door and you are not welcome, right? If you show up a little late, those kinds of things are the things that are, uh, that really shut students out that make you seem harsh and unfeeling, unwilling to take into account that they have messy lives just like we have messy lives, right? And there is no requirement that, you know, that it is not that if you are being kind, you say, hand in your paper whenever you want, right? I once tried that. <laughs> I had a class where um, I had two sections of the same class. I had 50 students. I was like, turn in your papers whenever you want. I will grade them throughout the term. Of course, what happened was that everybody wrote two papers the night before the last day of term. So I learned my lesson, right? So I have um, ways of, if someone says, I can't make it today, I'm late today, that is fine. We immediately talk about when can you get it in? Is it going to be in two days? Is it going to be in three, right? And we stay in communication. Mm -hmm. So it's not a carte blanche to just do anything. It's just a matter of being a little bit more flexible. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Chelsea, I think I saw that you had your hand up. I do. Thanks, Erin. Um, thanks for your presentation, uh, Kate. I really enjoyed it. And I really appreciate the distinction you're making between kindness and niceness. I think that's really useful. And also the strategies that you've offered us are fantastic. I feel like I'm taking a bunch of new ideas back to back to my class, which is which is exciting. So thank you for your generosity there. Um, my question is about how to scale some of these strategies up to a really big class. In mm -hmm. our department, we have a first year class that currently has over a thousand students and there's a team of people who, who teach it. I'm one of the professors, um, John McNamara is the other, and Joanne is the course coordinator, and then I think there's like 28 TAs. So it's, it's a big machine, yeah. and when I listen to the strategies that you're offering, I mean, I think they sound excellent, and I wish that I could sit down all 1,000 of the students and have them write a 100-word query, uh, you know, uh, into... Yeah chat GPT or, or, or on their phone or whatever, reflect on your weekend. Um, but it's just, it's not possible given sort of the infrastructure of the university and mm -hmm. the, the very existence of the large class. Yeah. And also on top of that, um, I agree with all that you're saying about trust. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with this many people all in one space, all in one class, um, mm -hmm. There has to be a lot of uh, sort of, uh, I don't know the right word, but there's a lot of strategizing around making sure that things are consistent. Students are all doing the same thing at the same time and it's all marked the same way just to keep the class functioning in a good way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice on how to cultivate kindness as you describe it in a large course structure that, has a lot of um, has a lot of rules 
to make it possible? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that is a really great question because, of course, when you have a thousand students, you need things to run like a well-oiled machine, right? It would be chaos if you were doing it some other way. I think there are a couple things. First, the language that you use in which to introduce your policies and explain them to students is key. There's language that says, you know, like, we are doing this, it's harsh, you will not take a foot out of step, right? There is, there is an authoritarian way to convey that language. And there is a way to say, hey, for your sake, to make sure that this is consistent, we're going to do things in a certain way, right? There are language choices, phrasing choices, and design choices that we can make on both our um, LMSs and in our documents that can really change the whole tenor of the classroom. I think having the means for someone to actually approach you if there really is something terrible happening, right? And articulating that in those policies is key. I also think that, um, to say, as I said before, coming from a place of um, we've got to make sure that this works smoothly and consistently is awesome. What we don't want to go to is something where we're articulating punishment all the time and conveying we don't trust any of you because we think that a small number of you will try and get away with something. In terms of some of the exercises that I suggested, like um, when you're gathering data on what people think about the syllabus, for example, trying to have small group conversations with a thousand students is just not possible. But what you can do is use things like Mentimeter and other polling software, right? And start to get big pictures of how people are feeling about things using that kind of mechanism. And that has been really successfully used with my colleagues on my campus who are teaching really large lecture classes, right? And so then it's a question of how do you craft those questions to get the kind of feedback and information that you need? And so it might be um, stuff like, how many of you had questions about this particular policy? Who thinks, uh, no, that's, that's a bad question. I'm doing this on the fly. But um, uh, was it clear that we meant A when we said B, right? Those kinds of things. Um, so I have more strategies for scaling up that are in my book. So maybe there's a copy in the library also that might be possible to look at. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Other questions or comments? And please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, there are two raised hands. Let me see if I can see. Emily. Hi, Kate. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, like Kate Connors, who just uh, just talked, we were so excited <laughs> and fangirling over your presentation because I think a lot of the things that we really struggled with over the pandemic as as teachers and um, as people trying to navigate, you know, as new um, instructors for courses and instructors of first year students, um, how how to do this the best and i think a lot of the things that you said really aligned with some of the best teaching experiences i had and i had to recover after the poem <laughs> that you put at the end because that's exactly how it worked for me was identifying with some of the biggest struggles i had during the pandemic as a parent you know of a young child or having a chronic debilitating illness when we couldn't go out into the world and and um offering the grace and the the kindness that I would need from my instructors to to students that were in my class and that was just some of the most meaningful uh, teaching experiences for me was watching my students blossom and grow into these junior academics while they were given that grace um, it was just anyways so thank you for That's putting awesome. all of this work into something that means so much to I know Kate Connors and I we're just so grateful now that we have a book and a resource to say this is what we <laughs> we believe too um so yeah I think I'm just very grateful <laughs> about this and and I think with commitment and with creativity there's definitely ways um 
to apply this to, to large classes for, for those young students who are just making sense of the academic world. Um, but it's tricky. <laughs> so yeah, it again. is tricky. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see, Mikey has a question here, or maybe a comment, I haven't finished it yet. I have been having some great conversations lately about how to manage bullying behaviors in classrooms. I'm wondering if you could speak to your thoughts on when, how to directly confront those behaviors versus when to lead through example. Okay, so uh, I actually have a big section in the book on this, on dealing with difficult conversations and the classroom dynamics that have gone awry. I think that the biggest uh, tool in my toolbox is the pause. So when somebody says something that is uh, offensive or just out of line in, in the ways that we're talking about here, pausing for a second and saying, that made me really uncomfortable. Does anybody else in the room feel uncomfortable? Maybe uncomfortable is not the word you would use. Maybe it's a different word, but asking, identifying what it is that made you feel and asking if others in the room felt the same thing. And then moving from there and sort of say, let's talk for a second about that discomfort. So you're sort of moving the conversation away from the action that may be very contentious into how that action has affected the classroom space. That is one strategy for diffusing things a little bit and allowing you to get back to the words or the thing that was done, right? Um, but in a slightly roundabout way that diffuses things. Also using questions like, where did you first learn that? Instead of uh, saying things like, that is completely unacceptable. Now, it's not that there aren't times when you have to say that is completely unacceptable. But when people are saying things that are often coming from a place of not knowing different, um, being able to say, where did you learn that? Or when did you learn that? It flips the script because instead of coming back with a defensive reaction, we're coming with a genuinely curious reaction. And once people start to think about like, well, where did I learn that? Very, very often they discover that that's coming from a place that they're not feeling great about. Um, there are also the situations where we're the ones who say something that's inappropriate, right? And so there's strategies in the book for what to do in those particular instances too. So the pause, the articulating what it did to us, and then asking if that also has impacted other people in the room is usually the place that I begin that conversation about that behavior or that uh, those words that have been used. There's one more hand raised. Uh, Tony. Uh, thanks for an engaging talk. Uh, appreciate certainly the tone that you're you're trying to set in the classes. Um, and I was going to offer the students and a question for you as well. Maybe a bit of counterbalance. You know, it's been I'm coming up to sabbatical. I need it. Um, it's been 20 years since I've been teaching and every year I'm surprised with something that students do that you wouldn't expect them to do. Uh, last year we caught hundreds of students cheating. Um, so the assumption that everybody's honest, uh, I think fails when you have that path that you provide. You know, you said that there's an easier road for them to take. A lot of students will take it. Then there's questions about personal responsibility that students have to take and that we want to develop. Um, there's questions that Chelsea raised about the size of the class, but those aren't really questions that I think we need an answer here, right here, right now. The biggest thing that I took out of your lecture that I, I think we have some students and early career scholars here is the need to be kind to yourself. These techniques for engagement take time. They take effort. They take uh, an emotional toll. So there's a lot that we have to put on the line in an era where publication is critical for junior scholars. The treadmill that we have to run to get into academia is far faster than now than it was then. And then there's pressures to serve on committees. There's pressures to have a life outside of it. So maybe if you could go back to some of your earliest messages about being kind to yourself, 
how do you balance, and you've talked about this with setting boundaries, but beyond the boundaries between personal life, the boundaries within work about boundaries for what I can apply for my undergraduate teaching, my graduate teaching, my graduate students, my research, research application, service, et cetera. How do we as faculty balance that and what's the message we should be passing on to the incoming generation? Okay, so I took a couple of notes because that, that was a lot. So give me a second here just to... Um... Just the last bit is what I'm interested in. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I would say that first of all, um, yeah, it takes time to do the things that I'm suggesting, but I would argue that it doesn't take less time to be a police person in relation to our students. That constant policing of, of their actions and their, um, their words, their, their, whether they're turning it in exactly on that minute, all of those kinds of things, that takes time, energy, and an emotional toll too. So I think it's a question of, you know, like, in some ways, picking your poison, right? Which is it that you would rather sort of devote that time to? In terms of balancing things, this is part of another project that I am part of called Care in the Academy that is trying to change the tenor of the whole picture of how faculty and staff are treated in academic circles. Because this is something that we can have some impact on personally, but that we also need some structural solutions to. So, for instance, in my uh, role as a department head, I have seen in previous iterations in my department, the standards for landing a job and for getting tenure or having your contract renewed go up and up and up. As departments, we need to stop that. We need to say, like, it's th these. this is just a rat race in which we should not be encouraging people to devote all of this time and energy to too many things. There are things we do control. We do control part of the tenure process. We do control part of the contract renewal process, right? Um, I think in terms of when new early career faculty enter the academy, we should be sitting down with them and saying, not only what is your plan for the next three years till contract renewal or for until tenure or whatever the standard is, but also, what is your plan for your wellness alongside that trajectory? It needs to be something that is planned from the moment that people get into the academy, and it should be something that department heads are challenging at every step of the way. And I think if we are people who have contractual safety, if we are people who have tenure, it's also incumbent upon us. And we need to be talking about this in our faculty senates, in the committees that we are on, we really need to hold the line against this constant creep of, aim, of more work, higher standards, all of those things, we've got to hold the line. Yeah, I like that. Uh, and, and I agree that there's structural issues at the very highest levels, you know, federal funding. Yes. Is the worst there. But I, I really like the idea of integrating wellness early on with your students yeah. and with faculty because the pressures for new people are frankly immense. Yes, they are. Agreed. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, I think our time is almost up. Um, can you hear me? I can, Erin. Now you're muted again. Now I can hear you. Okay, and I hope the echo is not too bad for everybody at home. Um, Kate, you've given us so much to think about. I can see lots of wheels turning as I look around the room. And I just want, I guess you can't see me, but I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time and sharing these ideas with us. I think you really planted many seeds that hopefully will, um, okay, I'll be so corny, but maybe this will like, fill, I feel like it uh, maybe will ripple on into, um, into the classes we teach and the effect that maybe it will have on our students as well. So um, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Really, thank really you, it. everybody. I so appreciate it. Thank right, you. Um, are you okay with us? So we made a recording of the talk, and um, I know um, 
uh, uh, Julia at CPI and others were wondering if it might be possible for us to post a copy on their website so that yep. uh, others who weren't able to attend um, and we'll yep. share through our channels as well if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. All right, thank you so much and we'll be in touch. Thank um, you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.